Hello, and welcome everybody to another episode of r slash pro revenge. My name's Ryan, the official host here on Reddit Voice, and I look forward to bringing you guys today's top stories. Before I do though, I'd really appreciate it if you could hit that subscribe button, as well as have notifications turned on, that way you could stay up to date with all the latest and the greatest. How my grandpa became the owner of a gas station slash garage. My family immigrated into America in the 1880s and settled in Nebraska. We were farmers for the first 80 years or so, but back in the 1960s, my great-grandma decided she was going to sell the entire farm before she died and simply give her sons a third of the money for inheritance when she passed. She had three sons. In 1969, my great-grandma passed, and her three sons inherited the money she had earned from selling the farm. My grandpa decided he would basically let that money sit until after he retired from the military. In 1971, he deployed to Vietnam for his second and final deployment. At the end of his deployment, he returned to Nebraska and retired after 22 years in the service. Now he had an old Chevy truck at the time and was in the process of building a concrete business with the money he had gotten from his inheritance. Well, during this time, his truck engine blew up. My grandpa was busy at the time and he didn't want to fool with his truck because he was busy. So he bought himself the engine he wanted to replace it with, which was an upgrade and he went down to the only garage in town and asked them if they'd be willing to put it in the truck. They agree on a price and told him to come back in a week or so. A week later, my grandpa comes back and picks up the truck. He admits he felt like a fool for not double checking the work but assumed since it was the son of his friend that the son would do right by him. This was a small town. Well, my grandpa opens up the concrete business, and he's busy. It comes time for his first oil change. This is about four months after he got the truck back. He's doing the oil change, and he notices that the engine he bought isn't the engine in his truck. It's a smaller one. This obviously pisses him off to high heaven, as my grandma liked to say. So he storms on down to the garage to talk to the shop. Earl was the owner. Earl comes out and denies any wrongdoing. Says he did as he was told and it shouldn't have taken him four months to bring the issue up. My grandpa tells Earl he needs to do what's right, and Earl refuses. It's important to note that this is a small town. Written contracts and so forth really isn't a thing. Your worth is your word. My grandpa tells Earl he's going to get him for this. Earl laughs and tells him to leave the shop. My grandpa goes down to the country and requests the record for who owns that gas station. Turns out it's an old family friend named Harold. My grandpa stops by Harold's house and starts inquiring about the business deal Harold has with Earl. Harold says that Earl rents the gas station slash garage from him. My grandpa asked Harold how everything's going and Harold confides that Earl hasn't paid him his rent in two months. My grandpa asks, do you have a written lease with Earl? To which Harold goes, nah, I sure don't. My grandpa then asks, what if I bought the gas station slash garage from you? Harold isn't completely on board with the idea, but my grandpa makes a strong point. Earl isn't paying his rent. Harold doesn't seem like he has much interest in being a landlord anymore. And my grandpa has the cash to buy the place outright. Harold, sensing something is up, asked my grandpa, Did Earl do something to you? You seem awfully interested in this garage. Ain't you busy with that concrete business of yours? And my grandpa fills Harold in on the story. My grandpa also mentions that he has a son, my father, who needs something to do, and he'd be happy to buy the whole thing from Harold for a fair price, and what happens after is his business. Also, it's important to note when Harold decided to rent this business to Earl, in that deal went all the equipment and tools that Harold had acquired over the years, so those belonged to the building. Harold and my grandpa came to a number that they both agreed on. A few days later, my grandpa paid Harold in cash in full for the business. The paperwork is done and my grandpa is now the proud owner of a gas station and mechanic shop. 
Now my grandpa senses that Earl ain't gonna be pleased when my grandpa fires Earl, so for extra good measure, my grandpa calls up the local sheriff who's a high school friend and asks the sheriff to come with him to break the news to Earl. So my grandpa and the sheriff go down to Earl's now former business, and they walk in, and before my grandpa can even say hello, Earl says, Now I told you, I didn't cheat you. My grandpa smiles and says, I'm not here about my truck. I'm here to fire you. Earl, with a look of confusion on his face, asks, You can't fire me. I own this business. My grandpa shows him the title and says, I'm now the owner of this building. To which Earl fires back. But I got a deal with Harold. And the sheriff speaks up. You do? Do you have a lease? Well, no, Earl says. To which the sheriff smiles and says, In that case, I'm going to need you to take your stuff and leave. Earl is fuming, pissed, grabs his toolbox, and storms out. My grandpa ended up hiring the mechanic that would occasionally work on his trucks at his concrete business. He had my aunt and grandma run the gas station full time and my dad would work there after school. We owned that garage for 25 years before my grandpa sold it to someone else. Landlord thinks I owe 8 months of rent. Didn't know I knew the tenant laws. Okay, not sure this goes here, but here it goes. This took place during the middle of 2018. Me and my wife and three kids were looking for a new place to rent because our current renter was selling and had given us a 60-day notice to move. During this time, my wife's mother had a friend. Let's call him Sam. Sam had a four-bedroom, two-bath house that he was in the middle of remodeling to get ready to sell. Because of this, certain parts of the house, like some of the walls, weren't fully painted and some of the floors were old. At the current time, my family really needed a place to stay and our budget wouldn't allow us any places to rent over a thousand a month. Keep in mind, I'm a disabled veteran and have a lot of time to sit around and research things when I need to. First part, signing the lease and getting the keys. During the lease signing, we went over to the house for Sam to point out all of the things that were being worked on and what things weren't complete while we were moving in. For example, the kitchen floor was being replaced. The kitchen counter, carpet, was being added throughout the whole house. Currently, all wood floors. When we got there, we pointed out that there was still trash all over the floor and bug traps all over the ground. He assured us that it would all be cleaned before we moved in. So we hand over our deposit and sign the lease for $1,000 a month. He says he's going on vacation out of state and won't be back for six months, but the contractors will be stopping by to work on the house. He leaves me a list of the work that's going to be done and then we wait. Move-in date. Three days later, we're given the go-ahead that we're able to move in and that he will be back in six months. We arrive at the house to find his two cars and motorcycle in the driveway, with nowhere but the street for us to park. This becomes very important later in court. The house is still just as dirty as the day we signed the lease, but with us really needing a place to stay, with me and my wife just taking pictures and noting everything wrong, we get to cleaning. Now remember, this was a four bed, two bath house. However, the owner left so much stuff in the house that the fourth bedroom was filled from wall to wall with junk. We just decided to close that door and not use the room. Keep in mind that because we didn't have access to the room because of the owner and landlord, we were allowed to deduct that room from the rent. This deduction of rent becomes a pattern soon. Living there. Now we lived there a total of nine months. During the first six months, we tried to get a hold of the landlord by phone with a way to pay rent, but we never got a reply from him after the day we got the keys. So everything that went wrong, we just kept track of. Place had bugs, nails sticking out of the floors, and many other hazards. Finally, on the seventh month, Sam returns from his vacation out of state and retrieves one of the cars in the drive. Tells us he's sorry for not responding and tells us we'll figure out the rent and fixing my issues over the next week. On month eight, I still haven't paid him anything as I send him a letter stating that I would be holding rent until the safety issues with the house are fixed. Where we live, this is legal. During this time, instead of just fixing the issues and getting rent from me, we are served with an eviction notice. Keep in mind, we have kept record of everything wrong with this house, including everything to code. Time in court. First red flag in the eviction is the copy of the lease that it was attached to. 
It was an altered copy of the original I still had, so the documents didn't even match. So let's do a little math each month I withheld rent. I gave a detailed invoice of all the charges I'm reducing the rent by. I sent all of this in the return of the eviction notice, and guess who shows up to the house five days before court? You bet, it's Sam. He starts yelling at the front door, telling me to give him my debit card so that he can go get my rent outright now. I calmly tell him that even though he's the owner slash landlord, that under the current laws, he must give me a 24-hour notice before being on the property, unless it's an emergency. I call the cops so that I can document that he showed up and tried to scare me into giving him money on the spot. Five days later, we show up at court and his lawyer walks over to me and presents me with a deal. He tells me that his client, Sam, would like to have me move out in two weeks and call the debt even. I tell him no thank you and we can talk about it with the judge. I present everything on my part, 100 of photos and invoices from each month about my rent deduction, plus all the safety violations. One room, no access, minus 250 a month times nine months. Two work cleaning and taking care of pools. Was in lease to have pool guy, never showed. 100 a month times nine months. Three lawn care, also in lease to be provided. 50 a month times nine months. Four storage for one motorcycle. 25 a day times nine months. Five storage for one car. 55 a day times nine months. 6. Storage for one more car. 55 a day for 7 months. He picked this one up after vacation. Safety violations. No CO2 detector in the house. No working smoke alarms. All windows are supposed to have screens and most were broken or missing because pool had no fence around it. Back door needed alarm to beep when opened. County safety code. Exposed wires on most electric outlets, ceiling fans not installed but wires just exposed, improper foundation for rear stairs leading out the back door, no license for enclosed backyard room, had a 30 foot by 20 foot area off back door which was enclosed by a screened area, county required a license for anything that was attached to the house, also the piled up junk in the fourth bedroom was considered a fire hazard. Now I picked the rate per day to store vehicles at the house because legally I could have had them towed off the property even though they're the owners. This is the rate the impound lot would have charged per day as the vehicle was in a lot. This added up to a total invoice of 36750 The 9000 owe for rent leaving, $27,750 owed. After hearing both sides, the judge ruled in my favor, giving my landlord three options. He could pay me $9,999, max allowed in small claims court here and I would have seven days to be off of the property. He could give me a normal 30-day notice to vacate and I wouldn't pay anything and he'd return my deposit in full within 24 hours after keys were returned. Or three, I could continue to live there but no rent would be owed until all safety issues were fixed and his stuff on the property removed. He chose to go with option two. On a side note, found out from my wife's mother about a year after we moved out, some of the shady upgrades he did to the house caused a house fire and burned down. This wasn't anything I did, but it felt so good to know that karma gets you in the end. Edit. Noticed something in one of my comments that I pointed out that Sam was doing upgrades. He didn't start doing these said upgrades until after I had submitted my response to the eviction. My response had to have everything I was showing in court so his lawyer was shown all the safety issues and all the pictures. Basically, he wanted to fix everything right before court and then say that the house had no issues. And there you have it, folks. The end of the epics. If you liked these stories, be sure to leave a like on the video as well as subscribe with notifications turned on. That way you could stay up to date with all the latest and the greatest. As always, my name is Ryan, the official host here on Reddit Voice, and I look forward to seeing you guys in the next video.